Hello, I am Dr. P. R. Padma, Professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Biotechnology and Bioinformatics at Avinashilingam University for Women, Coimbatore. The present module is dealing with the basic requirements and techniques of plant tissue culture. Plant tissue culture or PTC has become a common technique that is being adopted for the propagation of useful plant species in vitro and their manipulation both genetically and metabolically. This module introduces the learner to the basic requirements for plant tissue culture as well as the basic techniques involved in culturing plant cells. This module is part of the food biotechnology paper under the subject food science and nutrition. After completing this module, you will be able to know the concepts of plant tissue culture, to understand the medium and other requirements to start and establish a plant culture and to learn about the major techniques involved in plant tissue culture. This module is presented to give an overview of the definition and concepts involved in plant tissue culture, its major types and the basic techniques involved in propagating plant cells in vitro. So what is plant tissue culture? Plant tissue culture or we as mentioned PTC is a technique that uses an artificial medium to grow and maintain plant cells and tissue under controlled environmental conditions. Several parts of the plants like the leaves, shoot tips, root tips and growth buds or apical meristems can be used to initiate the plant tissue culture. Such parts that are used to initiate the culture are called explants. Plant cells have a unique property called totipotency that is most of the plant cells have the capacity to regenerate into the entire plant when they are placed in proper environment with nutrient and hormonal support. This property makes it possible for us to use several parts of the plants as sources of explants. To successfully culture plant cells, tissues and organs, there are several requirements that have to be taken care of. These are explained in considerable detail in this module. Let us start with the laboratory requirements, among which the first is the laminar airflow workbench. Since the growth of plant cells and tissues are propagated in strictly controlled conditions, the process of PTC should be operated under absolutely sterile conditions for which a laminar airflow or LAF workbenches are necessary. These are fitted with HEPA or high efficiency particulate air filters which efficiently block all types of microbial organisms. Air is sucked in through this filter and flows over the working area in the LAF thus ensuring that the work area is free of microbial contaminants. The LAF is also fitted with a germicidal ultraviolet or UV lamp which always is switched on for 10 to 15 minutes before every session of culturing. The next requirement for PTC are autoclaves and ovens. All the glassware and solutions used for PTC should be sterilized before use. The solutions and culture vessels used for PTC are generally sterilized using an autoclave. The temperature sensitive components in solutions like the growth promoting hormones are filter sterilized and used. The next item is the culture vessels. The containers in which the explants are cultured are called culture vessels. There are different kinds of vessels from test tubes to bottles and wide mouth troughs. All the vessels are fitted with lids that fit tightly. Additionally, they may also be fixed with membrane filters through which air exchange can occur while maintaining sterility. All the vessels are autoclavable and can be individually sterilized before use. Normally, the growth medium is prepared and aliquoted into the culture vessels in the required volumes. Then, the containers are closed with the lids and autoclaved. During autoclaving, the lids are fixed on loosely and then they are tightened after the autoclave cools down. The explants used for PTC are derived from the plants themselves. For this, the plant sources are collected and brought to the laboratory where they are surface sterilized and then dissected to prepare the explants to be cultured. For this purpose, specific dissection instruments like scissors, scalpels and forceps are needed. The dissection process 
makes use of sharp forceps and bent forceps. The cut parts as well as the explants are surface sterilized by immersing in detergent solution and sterilizing solutions as we shall see later in this module. The explants are then extensively washed in sterile distilled water and these steps are carried out using sterile glassware like petri dishes or beakers. The explants are handled only using blunt forceps after dissection to avoid mechanical shearing. To facilitate comfortable handling, blunt forceps of different lengths like 6 inches, 8 inches and 10 inches are used. All these instruments and glassware are individually wrapped and sterilized in the hot air oven before use. Sometimes, when the plant parts are dissected for preparation of explants, the aid of a magnifying device is needed for accuracy. For this purpose, a dissection microscope may be used. This instrument provides a platform for the dissection of tissues under magnified conditions. Now, we shall consider the incubation racks. In PTC, the cultures are usually incubated for long periods, extending over several weeks. Additionally, the growing cultures are autotrophic which means they start carrying out photosynthesis with the exception of some callous cultures and adventitious root cultures. Thus, there is a dire requirement for light for the photosynthesis to occur. Efficient photosynthesis can be mediated by alternating light and dark periods as is occurring in nature. This is facilitated by fitting fluorescent lamps in the incubation racks used for PTC. The lights are fixed at a distance of 10 to 20 centimeters from the culture vessels for maximizing the incidence of light on the cultures. Timers are also fitted to control the light and dark period duration. This is called a light cycle or a photo cycle. Most commonly, a 16 hour photo period and a dark hour 8 period is used and this photo cycle can also be optimized for different cultures. In cultures that are established well for mass production, Special equipment called bioreactors are used. These are vessels into which liquid nutrient medium is taken and agitation or circulation conditions are provided. The plant cultures are seeded into the bioreactors with the medium where they propagate to large volumes. The bioreactors can mass propagate both shoot and root cultures. Now let us take up the hardening chambers. After the plantlets are developed in culture, Including the induction of shoots and roots using shoot or root induction medium conditions, they need to be shifted to field conditions. But being nurtured and pampered in strictly controlled laboratory conditions, these plantlets will be very vulnerable to environmental shock when moved out of the laboratory conditions. In order to prepare them for the real environment, a process called hardening is adopted as explained later in this module. Hardening requires two major infrastructure requirements namely a greenhouse and a mist chamber. In the present day, commercial manufacturers are also combining the two to provide greenhouse mist chambers. Usually, the greenhouse mist chamber is constructed using glass and has a sprinkler system installed to provide highly humid conditions inside. The plantlets are transferred to sterile soil in the PTC laboratory, acclimatized for a few days and then transferred to this chamber where they undergo the hardening process. In several PTC facilities, more commonly in our country, a metal structure that is fitted with green netted sheets are used for the acclimatization and then the plant sets are shifted to similar structures with transparent plastic sheets instead of glass for hardening. After hardening, the plants are ready to be taken to the field conditions where they can continue to grow on their own without any medium support. Now, let us consider the medium requirements and the procedure for culturing plant cells or tissues. The PTC medium contains inorganic salts which are macro elements or major salts and micro elements or minor salts. Apart from this, a carbon and energy source which is usually sucrose, vitamins, amino acids, growth regulators which are plant hormones or their analogues and a gelling agent like agar. The most commonly used plant tissue culture medium is what is called as the MS medium or Murashige and Skoog medium. We will now consider the components and preparation of this medium. The inorganic elements that are required in higher quantity in the medium are referred to as the macronutrients in the medium. 
these are added as the salts of the elements because they are added at a higher concentration they are called major salts and a stock solution of these salts can be prepared which is called the major salt solution this contains six elements namely nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium magnesium and sulfur as for the major salts the inorganic elements that are required at a lower concentration are called minor salts and the stock solution of these salts is called the minor salt solution the minor salts include iron manganese zinc boron copper and molybdenum though they are used in low quantities these elements are absolutely essential for plant growth and are therefore vital components of the final growth medium sucrose is the most commonly used carbon source in the plant tissue culture medium though other sugars sugars like lactose maltose galactose raffinose trehalose and cellobiose have also been tried the best way to use sucrose in the medium is to add the sugar into the prepared mixture of medium and then autoclave it this causes the hydrolysis of sucrose to its component sugars of glucose and fructose which seems to be the ideal source for the medium the use of individual sugars that is glucose and or or fructose ironically does not work as satisfactorily as hydrolyzed sucrose similarly filter sterilization of sucrose solution before addition into the medium as an alternative for autoclaving also does not work satisfactorily the next component in the medium is the growth regulators in order to induce the plant cells or explants to start multiplying and growing in culture a variety of growth regulators are used normally these constitute the plant hormones or phytohormones four types of plant hormones namely auxins cytokinins gibberellins and abscisic acid are commonly used the choice of the hormone or a combination of them depends on the type of culture that we wish to initiate or grow also as some of the hormones break down quickly in the medium more stable derivatives of these compounds are also used auxins can induce cell division cause shoot elongation callus or undifferentiated cell mass formation as well as root induction depending on the derivative and the concentration at which it is used The most commonly used auxin is indole acetic acid IAA or its naphthyl derivative NAA for cell division and shoot elongation. To induce callus formation another auxin called 2,4-D that is 2,4 dichlorophenoxy acetic acid is most commonly used. Cytokinins are used for cell division, shoot differentiation as well as in somatic embryogenesis which we shall discuss later in this module. they can also increase the metabolic activity of the cells in culture the most commonly used cytokinins are bap benzylaminopurin and kinetin usually a combination of auxins and cytokinins is used in ptc to induce shoot or root growth and differentiation the ratio at which each of these components is used decides which process that is morphogenesis embryogenesis callus initiation root initiation or shoot proliferation is induced in culture generally the initiation and maintenance of callus cultures requires both auxin and cytokinin while only auxin is enough for root culture and only cytokinin for shoot culture the concentrations of the plant hormones used also depend on the type of explant used and the species of the plant that is used in addition to the auxins and cytokinins gibberellins and abscisic acid are also used for specific purposes in plant tissue culture the most commonly used gibberellin is ga3 apart from the above discussed components the medium used for ptc is also supplemented with other components like vitamins amino acids and some organic acids the mature plant cells are capable of synthesizing all or most of these components but the immature plant cells that are coaxed for growth in culture need to be supplied with these components the major vitamins added to the medium are thiamine riboflavin niacin pyridoxine folic acid pantothenic acid biotin ascorbic acid tocopherol myoinositol or mesoinositol and para aminobenzoic acid The nitrogen source in the medium is sometimes provided as amino acids though ammonium salts are also commonly used. It is sometimes observed that the nitrogen is more readily available from amino acids than from ammonium salts. Again, 
This differs with the type of culture and the plant species involved. Organic acids like pyruvic acid and other TCA cycle intermediates are also added to PTC medium as supplement. Apart from these, complex mixtures like coconut milk, casein hydrolysate, yeast extract and tomato juice are also sometimes added to the medium to promote cell division and growth as these contain several growth factors. However, these mixtures are not very preferred by many because of the variations in quality and quantity of the components in them from one batch to the next. Hence, synthetic components are much preferred over these natural mixtures. Sometimes, to promote growth, activated charcoal is added to the medium. This promotes growth by adsorbing some inhibitory components like phenols that are released by the growing cells themselves. In addition to this, at times some antibiotics may be added to the medium to control the growth of microorganisms. Apart from the nutritional and growth promoting components, we also need inert supporting material or gelling agents in the medium. The most commonly used gelling agent is agar. Gelatin, phytogel, agarose and other such gelling agents have also been tried but are not as satisfactory as agar. Now, let us take up the sterilizing agents. The explants used for plant tissue culture are usually collected from the field or from the wild where they are exposed to all the environmental chemicals and air and water borne microorganisms apart from the plant infesting microorganisms. It is therefore immensely vital to surface sterilize the explants and wash them thoroughly before introducing them into the cultured conditions. The most commonly used surface sterilizing agents include hypochlorite either of sodium or calcium, mercury chloride, 70% ethanol, silver nitrate and hydrogen peroxide. It is also highly desirable to use a detergent before the surface sterilant to increase the wettability. The choice of the sterilizing agent, its concentration and the duration of exposure also depends on the explant being used. Many types of explants can be used for the initiation of plant tissue culture. The choice of the explants depends on the type of the culture to be initiated. The most commonly initiated culture is the organ culture and the type of culture initiated is called a meristematic culture because the meristem or the growth bud is used for initiation of these cultures. The shoot tip can also be used as a growth bud. The shoot tip contains the apical or terminal growth bud. The axillary or lateral growth buds are present at the base of the leaves which later develop into the branches. The young stalk of the leaf or the young stem connecting the leaves is called the axil. The axil is also used to initiate meristematic cultures. Another part that is used quite frequently to initiate meristematic cultures is the leaf. The stem and petiole can also be used to initiate organ cultures of plants. Apart from organ cultures, several other types of cultures can be initiated. These include the seed culture, callus culture, anther culture, embryo culture, single cell or suspension culture and the protoplast culture. Embryos can also be induced to form from stomatic cells and this process is called somatic embryogenesis. Having considered the major requirements, let us now move on to the medium preparation. Many different types of media have been used in PTC and the most commonly used medium is MS medium which was devised by Murashige and Sku. It contains specified volumes of the stock solutions of macro elements, micro elements, vitamins including mesoinositol, amino acids and sucrose. The required phytohormones are also added. Then the pH of the medium is adjusted to 5.6 to 5.8 and after all the components are mixed well, a solidifying agent like agar is added and the mixture is heated to about 60 degrees centigrade to dissolve the agar. When the mixture is still warm, it is aliquoted into the culture vessels at the required volume. Approximately 20 ml medium is added to each culture tube and 25 to 40 ml medium is added to each culture flask based on the size of the flask. The tubes are cotton plugged and the flasks are covered loosely with the screw cap lid and autoclaved. After autoclaving, the tubes or flasks are allowed to cool under sterile conditions and once cooled to room temperature, the lids are tightened and the medium can now be used for initiating new cultures as well as transferring cultures for subculture. Now we come to the actual culturing protocol. As already discussed earlier, several plant parts can be used as sex plants depending on the type of culture to be initiated. 
whatever be the type of explants it is desirous to collect them from healthy plants which are free of microbial and viral contaminants it is also highly desirous that the explants are collected and used freshly immediately after collecting however in some cases where an attempt is being made to save a near extinct species of plant whatever explants are available will have to be used if such explants are used they have to be extensively washed with antibiotics and fungicides to free them of contaminating organism to mass propagate a plant species the preferred method is to initiate seed culture wherein the seeds are surface sterilized and inoculated into the growth medium where they germinate the seedlings thus formed are free from any contaminants because they are germinated under controlled sterile conditions and explants can be cut from these plantlets and micropropagated irrespective of the type of explants used if they are collected from plants grown in the field or in the wild they need to be thoroughly surface sterilized if the explant has a waxy coating one should also use a wetting agent before the sterilant to ensure good contact of the sterilant with the surface of the explant the commonly used wetting agents include detergents like twin 20 or tpol solution or alcohol at 70% concentration Normally the explants are immersed in the wetting agent for up to 15 to 20 minutes the duration of exposure also depends on the type and nature of the explants more often the explants are immersed in detergent for 15 to 20 minutes and then transferred to 70% alcohol for 60 seconds before being transferred to the sterilized solution several types of surface sterilizing agents can be used with the explants as discussed earlier sometimes combinations of the surface sterilizing agents like mercury chloride and sodium hypochlorite may also be used the duration of exposure to the sterilizing agent is also dependent on the explant type during the sterilization process the bottle containing the explants and sterilant is swirled frequently to enhance the effectiveness after this process it is very vital to remove all traces of the sterilizing agent by extensive washes with several changes of sterile distilled water now the explants are ready for culture The prepared explants are carefully and gently lifted using sterile blunt forceps and transferred onto the growth medium prepared earlier. The explants are usually pushed partially into the medium instead of just overlaying. Complete immersion of the explant is avoided and this ensures that the explant is in good contact with the medium and also has the exposure to the air in the container for gaseous exchange during growth. All the types of explants except the seed cultures and callus cultures need to be exposed to adequate light for optimal growth. This is ensured by providing a 16 hour light and 8 hour dark photo cycle using a timer that controls the fluorescent lamps fitted on the incubation racks. During the photo period light of 4 to 10 into 10 power 3 lux intensity is provided. For the seed cultures and the callus cultures complete darkness is preferable which can be achieved by placing the culture vessels in a dark box or by covering the bottles with dark paper before placing on the incubation racks The incubation racks are usually placed in a room that is maintained at 25 to 28 degrees centigrade The plant cultures usually take several weeks to develop during this period it is very essential to monitor them carefully for any contamination or change If a culture is appearing unhealthy it should be removed immediately to ensure that the adjacent cultures are not affected now we shall consider how propagation and subculturing are done a newly initiated culture usually grows first by shooting this means that the shoot system propagates first each explant can give rise to several shoots as this takes 2 to 6 weeks time medium depletion can occur it is therefore important to subculture the growing explants which means transferring them into fresh medium usually from a single explant multiple shoots develop this can be prized apart carefully and inoculated into fresh medium for further growth this is called subculturing one single explant can give rise to hundreds and thousands of plantlets by subculturing similarly the callus tissue also needs to be subcultured for further maintenance for this The callus is cut into pieces under sterile conditions using sterile scalpel and minced gently into small pieces. Each of these can propagate into large masses of callus. From this callus tissue, whole plantlets can be developed and mass propagated by inducing differentiation and organogenesis.
Modulating the levels of phytohormones in the medium induces differentiation and leads to the formation of organs like shoots, roots, leaves, etc. Multiple shoots develop from the explants which are then transferred into medium containing high auxin to cytokinin ratio to induce root formation. Higher concentration of cytokinin induces shoot formation from callus while higher concentration of auxin is needed for root induction. Medium levels of both cytokinin and auxin induces both shoot and root formation. And medium level of cytokinins with low level of auxins induces dedifferentiation and results in callus formation. Gibberlins are used for shoot elongation and leaf generation. Only roots or shoots can also be induced for specific applications like mass production of specific secondary metabolites. These cultures are called adventitious root cultures and shoot cultures. At this juncture, we need to understand another concept called somaclonal variation. When plants are produced by plant tissue culture, sometimes variations occur in the resultant plantlets. This variation is called somaclonal variation which is more common in the plants regenerated from callus tissue and can be either genetic or epigenetic in origin. So, maclonal variation has both advantages and disadvantages. The advantages include improved traits and better strains. On the other hand, it can also result in genetic instability or inferior strains which can be disadvantageous. Sometimes, somaclonal variation can be wantedly induced to achieve desired traits. Another process to be considered is called somatic embryogenesis. The somatic cells of the plants can be induced in culture to form embryos. This process is called somatic embryogenesis. The somatic embryos are different from the seeds in that they do not contain the seed coat and the endosperm. Somatic embryos have several applications including the production of virus-free plants and genetically uniform plants. Finally, we come to hardening, which is the last step in micropropagation. As the plantlets produced in culture are propagated in highly controlled and pampered conditions, they cannot be transferred directly to the field where the conditions are often harsh. Therefore, the plantlets produced in culture need to be prepared for the field condition. This process is called hardening. This is preceded by a pre-transplant stage where the plantlets are transferred into compost soil and kept in highly humid conditions in a mist chamber. Once they acclimatize, they are transferred to pots containing soil. For a short duration, these pots are maintained in the mist chamber and then transferred to the greenhouse. Once they are hardened, the plants are ready to be transplanted into the field. So these are the major steps in plant tissue culture. Plant tissue culture has several benefits and advantages which include mass production of plants, improved trained seed plants, production of virus free and disease free plants, development of plant tissue banks by freezing the regenerated tissue or artificial seeds, production of genetically identical plants by somatic embryogenesis, mass production of specific secondary metabolites, year round production of plants and their products and preservation of endangered plant species. Thus, in this module, the various steps involved in the mass propagation of plants from explants have been considered. Plant tissue culture has several applications in the field of food and nutrition which we shall consider in the next module. With this, I am Padma signing off, wishing you a very happy learning experience. Thank you.